It's time! The DDP, that's the Devlin Door Podcast, episode 7. My name is Martin Devlin, and a man of leisure, pleasure, and much treasure is Simon Dool, who commentates worldwide for the beautiful game that is cricket. Dooley, welcome back, mate. Thank you, Marty. Thank you very much. Nice to be with you again. We got cricket to talk, of course. You got the playoff uh, 100 tomorrow, Manchester and London. I want to talk about the second test, even Stevens between South Africa and England with the third to play. We'll touch on the Premier League, the All Blacks. <laughs> I mean, you're away from home, so you can avoid a bit of that. Uh, the Serena Circus continues, and a guy called Colin de Gronholm retired. But we'll kick it off, of course, with the cricket. So the playoff 100 tomorrow, how big a deal is this in England? Well, it's been pretty good. Um, the games, to be fair, Marty, the, the, this year the men's games haven't been great. We haven't had a lot of tight ones, um, and it's been a bit of a, a one-sided affair as far as the games are concerned. So that, that's been a bit of a concern. Yep. But, um, you know, the women's side of things has been magnificent. They've had record crowds, or we've had record crowds at most of the grounds around the country for the women's game. And I think that's where the growth of, of the game is, and that's what the 100 is doing, particularly for England women's cricket. I would think in the next... Um, let's say the next three or four years, you'll see the England women's side really take off and, and almost compete, I think, compete with Australia wow. in the next few years. The okay. men's stuff is is okay. Um, could be better, I think, would be if, if I was writing a report card. But, um, yeah, looking forward to the um, the run, London spirit taking on the Manchester Originals tomorrow. So, Owen oh, Morgan skippers the, the spirit. Um, you know, there's some, some decent names there, but they've lost a few of their key overseas players. So, that's been a, a bit of an issue for them. Manchester Originals have got, I think, a very, very strong side and probably should take that. They're on the way up. The London Spirit were top of the table three weeks ago, uh, three sort of matches ago, and now they've lost a couple in a row. So they find themselves on the way down. Look, I love the fact you support women's cricket so much. You're so vocal. You're so public about it. And I remember even speaking to you a couple of years ago and when the World Cup was going on and you said, look, finally, they've got some decent pitches to play on. They've got some decent grounds mm. to play on. And, and, and obviously that makes a hell of a difference, does it? I mean, it must make a psychological difference, but also just in terms of playing when, when you know you've got actually good boundaries, when you know you've got a crowd and when you know you've got a good, a good stonking pitch. Yeah, and I, th I think the you know the girls do certainly, um, and I say that with all due respect, the girls, the women, the yeah, ladies, sure, mate, um, you know, however term, however term you would like to use, um, they certainly feel it when they turn up at Lords or the Oval or Edgebaston or Trent Bridge. Um, you know, they they feel it. They, they it's it's a different atmosphere. They've been stuck on some of the outgrounds around the country for years and years and years, and and they're now playing the Premier Tournament at the Premier Grounds. Before the men, some they've played one round of games after the men this year as well. So the men have played an afternoon game, the ladies have played the night game, which has been fantastic. Uh, and, you know, the England coaching job is up for grabs at the moment, the England women's coaching job. I think it is the time to take over that job. So it's a really, it's going to be a really sought after position. And from what I've seen, in, as far as the talent is concerned, throughout the uh, the women's comp, I, I think it's a great time to be taken over this England women's side. And, and uh, you know, as I say, I think given, given two years, there's some real talent around. They'll be competing with Australia. So England gets spanked by an innings in 12. South Africa gets spanked by an innings in 85. We'll pick the third one starting next Thursday, mate. I can't do it. Just, I mean, look, for the, I think, um, I don't think England were undone, uh, underdone in the first test. A lot of talk about being underdone, but they weren't. They just, South Africa caught them on the hop, they were out bowled, and um, you know, South Africa were pretty And England turned around in that um, different test match. Winning the toss was, was quite crucial, obviously, having um, a bowl first. Uh, and and they were, you know, they just they bowled better. And then when it came time, Ben Stokes sort of found the way and the will to, to pick up a test match 100. Folks was brilliant as well. Uh, and they just put too many on the board for South Africa to even ever get near, and and that was it was always going to be tough. Once that lead gets past 150 to 200, in the, the you know, and you've got a bat sort of in third innings after failing in the first innings, and you're sort of you're, you're 200 runs behind minimum, it just becomes a, a mental drain and, and a really tough one to get out of, especially considering it was only what day two and a half, day three. Um, you know, when they had to do that. So uh, brilliant from England. I, I don't know what will happen in the third test, third and final test. It's, um, they're just worth watching, though, as every test of the summer in England has been worth watching. The way they're playing um, and, you know, the crowds, the way that the, the sort of they've gotten behind Brendan and, and um, 
and the skipper. Um, I just think it's it's been quite phenomenal. All right, then, let's talk about Colin de Gronholm. I've had a bit of a Twitter war with a few people about this. I just want to make it clear. Look, I mean, I've always liked the guy as a player and everything, but, you know, eulogising him as some kind of New Zealand cricket great, I just think it's a bit insulting to those. Look, I had a guy yesterday who's actually an ambassador, I think, for India, who was saying to me that I'm um, trying to compare him to Wright, Coney and McCullum because he's got a better test batting average and better than Vittori when it comes to bowling. And I was thinking, good Lord, man, you can't put DeGron home in the same sentence as those guys. I'm not being insulting by saying that. I'm just being real. Well, I mean, uh, with, with all due respect, Marty, I mean, I've got a better test bowling average than Daniel Vittori, but I would never consider myself a better test bowler. Right. Uh, you know, so that's just an absolute crock. Look, I, I think I think Colin was Colin's a decent cricketer. I, I actually think he overachieved at test level and underachieved with the white ball. Because I thought he was always going to be a far better white ball player from New Zealand's point of view. When I look at his numbers in white ball cricket, and he only played 45 one-day internationals. Now, a guy of that sort of, he really should have been playing, I don't know, in excess of 100 one-day internationals, I would have thought, as a genuine all-rounder. But he just, he couldn't quite come to grips with batting at at the one-day international level. Um, And nor at the T20 level. When you watch the way he played, domestic cricket, everybody thought he will be a white ball, you know, be a really good white ball player. So I, I think I'd put him in that category of underachieving in, in white ball cricket and probably overachieving at test match level. Um, you know, he, he, yeah, he averaged, what, close to 39, I think, with the bat and 32 or something like that, 32 and change maybe with the ball, just under 33. So, look, a decent career, but again, you're comparing him with guys who played 70, 80, 90, 100 test matches. He mm. played 29. Yeah. You know, it's all about, it's also about longevity. It's about um, fitness. It's about a lot of things that, that, um, that, that go into that. But the, the ability to play 70, 80, 90, 100 test matches is not just about your talent. It's also about your commitment to the role and commitment to the job and, and, and fitness levels and all those things as well. So, no, I couldn't have him in that category. Terrific guy. Mm. Absolutely. Mm great you know genuine great bloke but um struggled with the media and and i think um you know at, at times sort of he'll probably say he felt with the white ball he underachieved as well simon Dawley's is with us it's the ddp this is episode seven of the devil and Dawl podcast Dawley, when the all blacks were announced yesterday i mean you could hear the sign in my voice when i said it good lord but when the all blacks side was announced <laughs> yesterday the same run on 15 there you could feel a collective groan around the country. And look, and that's, again, it's no insult to the players and it's no insult to the coach and the selectors. I think it's just a realisation that, listen, this is as good as it gets for us right now. We can rearrange all of these players. We can put you there, put A, put B, take C back out and replace him with D. But essentially, it's the same chairs around the same restaurant table as we play Argentina again. Jack Nicholson, Helen Hunt made it, isn't it? Yeah. As good as it gets. That's it. What a movie that was. Hey, what a great movie. Brilliant movie. Yeah, yeah look... I was sort of having a bit of a think about this and, and re-watching the game, uh, last week's game, and, and sort of thinking to myself, why? Where, where have we got to with our rugby at, at, at the moment? And is it... And I sort of I was trying to rack my brains. I mean, if you think about where, where we've always been seriously strong, is club rugby, NPC rugby, and that's led into our super rugby, yep. which has then led into our All Blacks, you know? Well, I just wonder whether the drain of the last 15, 20 years... Now, if you think about the last 15, 20 years, the amount of quality that has been playing, whether it be Japan, Europe, England, Italy, you know, France, all around the yeah. world. And, and, and I'm just starting to think, has it all finally caught up with us? Is it starting to catch up with us? Are we just the fourth, fifth best side in the world now? Is that where our players are at? And and it's not saying they're not good enough to beat South Africa or they're not good enough to beat Argentina or Australia on their day or England, but... but are we going to be able to do that consistently again? I, I, I don't know. Maybe we are at some stage. But, you know, we've lost, you know, I mean, I, I, you know, I wrote a whole heap of names down, but it, it doesn't really matter who they are. We've lost quality, you know, NPC and super rugby players for the last 15 years to overseas. And, and that drain weakens our, our talent at home and it weakens the opposition that our guys have got to play. Against. Yeah. I just wonder, I mean, I'd like your thoughts on that. No, that's is true. That, Look, is it, you know, yeah, a, a, you know, a lot of people. Yeah, this is this this is where you know the discussion is going. It's not really pointing the finger at at the players because, as I say, that is that is it. That no. is what that is what you've got. It's more pointing the finger at New Zealand rugby and the administration that has let 
you know, the, the, the castle, which was on solid foundations. I mean, it's like people have tunneled under the wall mm. like they did in the medieval times and they've lit a fire and all of a sudden the towers are coming crumbling down. That's that's where we're at, you know, at the moment. It's true, mate. And, yeah. and you know, you can sit there and you can tear your hair out and you can blame this and blame that and it's Fozzie's fault and it's everyone's fault. But the fact is, is that, you know, when you watch that game against Argentina, the most dispiriting thing for me was the last 20 minutes and all black side, all we had was... Give it to that guy, run up, he gets tackled. Give it to that guy, run yeah. up, he gets... I mean, it was just bereft. It was like watching Wimbledon play football in the 80s and the 90s. All they could do was yeah. pump the ball up the field. We had no ideas, no penetration, no line-busting ability, yeah. and a real lack of confidence. And that's the thing that gets me the most. All Black side, Simon, you know this. When the, when the Black Caps were at their best, you walked out there swinging it. You know, you're swaggering. Yeah. You got your chest puffed. You want the ball. You want the bat. The All Blacks are saying, come to daddy. Well, that's not happening anymore, mate. No, everybody knows they're vulnerable now as well. And so the players, I guess, are probably feeling a little bit that way as well. And it's, you know, I've played some very average cricket teams, uh, you know, over, over my many years as well. It's, and it's a horrible, it's a horrible way. But the All Blacks have very rarely ever felt this. And, and as a country, we have very rarely ever yeah. felt the, this way about the All Blacks. So it's very new territory. So we're all looking for something something that's wrong now i mean look I, I know ian foster i've talked to ian foster many many times but um look he's not a winning coach so so you know there is an issue there he's never been a winning coach as far as teams he has taken over or taken along on his own so you know that, that's that's got to be a, there's got to be a little bit of a concern there from a new zealand rugby point of view the appointment and the reappointment so there'll be a little bit of a concern there but the, the bottom line is you know we, we may just be we used to lead the way in fitness. That was the other thing we used to do. We used to, that last 20 minutes of a rugby test, we would genuinely own. We don't do that anymore. Other sides do that to us. Other sides are, are fitter and stronger. And, and and we have led the way for so long, but now sides are caught up. And, you know, it's, it's actually, it's okay. I'd rather see us sort of have to fight our way back. Well, it's, I suppose what it does is it, it actually asks the question, doesn't it? I've always sort of great all black side as a wounded all black side. But, you know, there's only so many wounds you can sustain before you fall <laughs> over. Well, that's, it, isn't it? <laughs> well, that's the thing. So this weekend, I mean, you know, Simon, say it out loud. You know, if we beat Argentina this weekend, what do you mean if we beat Argentina? But that's the question, isn't mm. it? If we beat Argentina, that was yeah, never look, a question. It, it, it was never the question. But, I, I mean, I look, I can see us bouncing back and I can see us winning this weekend and that's okay. It's a bit like the South African thing. I, I couldn't quite see them beating us, but they, they did quite comfortably and then, you know, then we go out and, and we beat them the, the week after when there's almost, it's almost like the pressure's off. Yeah. Argentina have now now won in New Zealand. You know, they've got that little bogey off their back. They'll be a little bit less pumped up for this weekend, dare I say it. And, and we, we, we know that we have to sort of bounce back and, and we'll probably win this weekend. And will everything be right again? No, it won't. It's just, it's just going to be, this is where we're at. We're fourth, fifth best in the world at the moment. And We've got to we've got to figure that out. But remember all those years, Muddy, all of those years when we were the best side in the world and we couldn't win a rugby world cup. Maybe this is the time. Maybe this is the time where we're fourth or fifth best in the world and we go out and we we put a show on come World Cup time.